in this virtual, virtual way. Uh, uh, before I get really going in the talk, I, I, I have to say I really love the themes of your meeting. And I had a chance to speak with uh, several of you earlier. And I just, I just, I, I admire your, your thinking about uh, the three themes, the expectations, the emphasis on disparities, uh, which I've put IHI um, in a very uh, clear position around that there is no um, quality really without equity. Um, and lastly, you know, the fact that you haven't been, that you don't focus on despairing, but you in fact seek solution. So I really ap I appreciate and applaud your, your efforts to, to examine these three um, topics, expectation, disparities, and solution together, you know, in, in one thing, um, which I think is such a brilliant idea. Um, I had a, a, a professor once um, and an old and a mentor who uh, told me that uh, a long time ago that you should always have a, an agenda slide in a talk. So I've uh, faithfully adhered to that advice ever since, more or less. Um, and uh, as I've gotten uh, somewhat older, I, I find that increasingly my agendas are getting shorter and shorter, um, which is to say, uh, perhaps I have less to say, I don't know, or fewer words to say it in. Uh, but anyway, here is my agenda. I want to tell you three uh, important stories, and I uh, oh, sorry, that's in the way. I want to tell you three important stories uh, that I think are about where uh, we're going in healthcare, um, and uh, then share five ideas for what the new design of a health creating system might look like in the future. I hope this will be of use to you as you uh, contemplate uh, in your discussions how to change those, uh, those expectations, how you address those disparities, and how you seek solutions to the pressing challenges that we all experience uh, in our world today. OK, uh, story number one. On August 6, 1945, at 8.15 AM local time, as the Japanese were waking up, American bomber uh, airplanes flew over Hiroshima, Japan, and dropped an atomic bomb uh, that caused 80,000 instantaneous deaths and 60,000 more in the moments that followed. This was the single bloodiest moment in the bloodiest war in all of human history. Japan surrendered just nine days after these images were taken. By the, end, uh, by the early 1950s, it was impossible to imagine how Japan, which looked like what you're seeing here on the screen, could rise from the ashes of this great world war to become what is today the third biggest economy in the world. But that is exactly, as many of you know, what happened. In the years after the war, Japanese industry lay in virtual ruin. Infrastructure and manufacturing, all the things that you might imagine, were non-existent. Supply chains had been crippled and consumer demand did not exist. Back then, the Japanese automotive industry was known mainly for their habit of copying designs from other manufacturers. Toyota's first passenger car, the 1936 Model AA, was a blatant copy of Dodge and Chevy designs. And this uh, picture here on the screen the, is a World War II era truck called the Model KC, and it was made from spare parts. Its cabin was replaced uh, with wood panels due to shortages in steel, and the number of headlamps, as you can see here in the picture, was reduced to just one headlamp because of supply scarcity of the raw materials to produce headlights. Toyota, uh, the car manufacturer, nearly went bankrupt in 1949. And by 1950, its production capacity was limited to just over 300 vehicles. By comparison, US automakers at the same time, General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, made over 7 million cars in the same year when Toyota was making just 300. And yet in this very same period, in the heart of the crisis that Japan was undergoing, when these automotive uh, uh, industrialists and leaders were at absolute rock bottom, uh, these industrialists and automakers were laying the groundwork for what would become their salvation. Japanese automakers faced a challenge. Jap uh, demand was simply not present. Uh, raw materials were in short supply, as illustrated by this car. Much of their history was in knockoffs. They could continue to cut back. They could cut corners. They could reduce costs and produce cheap, low-quality cars that they might hope would create a market. Or they could try something different. They could try and beat out German and US competitors by creating cars that were even more reliable 
and higher quality than the best cars on the market. I think most of you probably know because you or a friend or someone else in your family probably owns a Toyota, you know what they chose. And you may know exactly how they got there. W. Edwards Deming, a little known statistician, had been in Japan helping the US occupying forces to conduct a census. The Japanese had learned that Deming had some radical ideas about quality, in particular the idea that by focusing on reducing variation, you could both improve quality and simultaneously reduce cost. Deming's ideas transformed the Japanese approach to car making. It really changed the industry altogether. And this is a picture of him in, in one of his first seminars where he was teaching these ideas. These ideas transformed the Japanese approach to car making, focusing them on improving quality and producing highly reliable cars that earned a reputation for almost never breaking down or requiring repairs. By 1975, just 25 years after Deming started and after uh, those bombs were dropped, it would be Toyota would become the most imported brand of automobile in the United States. Today, Toyota is the largest car maker in the world. The lessons of this story are perhaps obvious. We have been living through in the last year and some months and continue to live through devastation in healthcare. Our hospitals have been and are overwhelmed. Our staff have endured traumatic stress and continue to do so and will live with that traumatic stress for many, many years to come. Our economies have suffered tremendously. Parts of the world like India and Brazil, among other parts of the world are still in the throes of this harrowing pandemic. And the end line for many countries, including Canada and the US isn't exactly apparent. We can see some daylight, but it's not entirely clear when life will be entirely normal. But already we can start to see something shaping up. And the question is, how will we emerge from this? Will we be ruled by short-term thinking that might force us to choose austerity, cost-cutting, making cheap, low-quality care in the way that Toyota was confronted with the choice of becoming an austere, cost-cutting, and making cheap and low-quality cars? Or will we have the imagination of last century's Japanese industrialists and once again turn to quality, actually, as our salvation, both to create better care and ultimately to lower cost. Okay, story number two. This is a story from Health Partners, uh, a system not far from the Canadian border. Uh, it's a system of 1.8 million members uh, and eight hospitals headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's a medium-sized system in a medium-sized city in the middle of America. Minneapolis, much like the rest of the US, has gone through three successive waves of coronavirus. Uh, but it had an important additional overlay. Minneapolis was the home of George Floyd, uh, a man who was killed a year and two days ago. And as all of you likely know, almost exactly uh, on this date, a year and two days ago, George Floyd, a black man, was murdered by police officers in broad daylight, setting off a racial reckoning that has had ripple effects all over the world. In Minneapolis, the city was gripped by outrage, frustration, and unrest, as so many cities were around the world. And so was the Health Partners Health System, whose hospitals served to care for many in both the community and in law enforcement alike. Health Partners itself was consumed. Staff and patients alike were sitting at the intersection of two crises, twin pandemics of COVID and racism. And in the midst of it was a leader, Andrea Walsh, the uh, person I showed you earlier, the CEO of Health Partners, and Nance McClure, the system COO. In recent conversations with both Andrea and Nance, they described their efforts to foster conversation, not avoiding the difficult terrain of racism, but facing it head on. Andrea presciently noted that while we have now a vaccine for COVID, there is no such vaccine for racism. Together, they focused on how to build safety within the complexity of today's challenges. Andrea and Nance reflected that there were four, really four major preconditions for inventing an equitable health creating system of the future. Four ways to not stand still. The first they found during this time was radical prioritization. COVID and racism pushed everything else aside. The list of hundreds of improvement projects, quality improvement efforts, patient safety efforts, hundreds of these projects and initiatives 
were put on hold and everything for at least a short period of time became about these twin crises and everyone was aligned and all in to help improve on them. Number two was radical transparency. During the pandemic, many reported that they were sharing information that might not have been shared before in new and different, fundamentally new and different ways. In, in Southwest Ohio, a group of healthcare organizations that IHI was working with created a common data system to track and follow COVID patients. In Seattle, Providence Health System uh, was sharing, is sharing data today on vaccine availability with a variety of stakeholders to ensure that no dose gets wasted in their environment. We've seen in this area a complete rethink on how we share information across boundaries. We've also described, Andrea and Nance also described, a new form of radical collaboration. Many of you know uh, that IHI has long had a philosophy of all teach, all learn, everyone having something to teach and everyone having something to learn. But rarely have we seen it demonstrated like we did during this pandemic. In New York, all the major systems, uh, a city where I work uh, in New York, all the major health systems there worked together. They collaborated to manage ventilator capacity and ICU beds, not as a single hospital as we usually do, but across the entire city, which is unprecedented. We've never done that before. In London, all the major hospitals built and shared a COVID patient transportation system. And they did that not in the months or you know, years that it would usually take to do it. They set it up in hours and they had it running the next day. Profoundly different forms of collaboration that we experienced during this time. And all of these were important, but above all else, I think during this time we learned that slow, going slow is actually a choice. Whether we intend it or not, whether we are deliberate in our choices or not, we can actually set the rate of change. We can change at the speed that we desire. We get to choose how fast we go. We could do what needs to be done in our systems and in our societies much, much faster. The old maxim proves true. When we find the will, we actually really do find new ways. And this applies to almost anything from the way science is done to the way we vaccinate in the public health response. Slow is not a given. Slow is absolutely a choice. We, as leaders in our health systems, and all of you, get to choose how and when we want to accelerate to get to the system we all need and that we all deserve. As health partners face the crises of its day and today, it responded not with rigidity and fear, but with agility, speed, and courage. These are the preconditions, I believe, of what makes new possible. Okay, uh, the third story I wanna tell you before getting to some new ideas. This is a photo of the James River in Richmond, Virginia, where my wife and family are from and where uh, we spent many years. Richmond, Virginia uh, was once the epicenter of the tobacco industry in the United States, the heartland of cigarette manufacturing. Tobacco was, grown in the fertile soils in the, uh, the middle of the state uh, of Virginia, upriver from Richmond and floated down on the river that you see here in the picture. Um, it, you know, it was floated down the James River, which is the name of the river, to what was known as Tobacco Row, some of the buildings behind the, the raised trellis that you see there in the heart of the city. These brick buildings uh, in Tobacco Row were where the leaves were taken off the boats, uh, processed and then rolled into Marlboro's, Camel's, Lucky Strike cigarettes. Even today, as you walk around Tobacco Row, you can almost smell the musky scent of the tobacco leaves uh, when you walk around there. And Richmond, because it loves its, uh, its tags and graffiti, has kept all the logos of the old tobacco companies painted on the buildings. Camel Joe, unfortunately, still lives on Richmond's buildings in Tobacco Row. In its heyday, over half of all cigarettes bought and sold in the US were made in these buildings, the ones you see here on the screen in the plants and tobacco row. By the mid 1970s, so much of the local economy of Richmond was based on tobacco that the newspapers in the city called the city Tobacco Town USA. It must have felt like these factories that you see here would never go away, that they were permanent features of the local economy and that they could never be anything but cigarette rolling facilities. But I'm guessing you all know that I wouldn't be telling you this story if that was in fact what happened. Everything changed. Smoking rates started dropping, regulation by the US government increased, a major lawsuit forced cigarette manufacturers to pay hefty annual fines because they had been lying about the health consequences of their product. 
In just a few short years, these buildings were vacated and have now been converted into luxury loft condominiums and fancy restaurants with only the graffitied walls to show of their tobacco past. I tell you this story because in the photo, you'll see another building in the back, uh, a high rise drab looking kind of ugly, ugly looking building, if you can see it there. It's that, it's that big building in the back. It looks like it was probably built in the 1960s or 70s, it, it was. Guess what that building is? It's one of the towers of the Virginia Commonwealth University's teaching hospitals. And as one of the main hospital towers, it has the requisite helipad at the top with multiple floors that the system brags about that are dedicated to ICUs and surgical theaters and general medical and surgical wards. I'm sure your institutions have a building that looks not dissimilar. Every time I see this picture, I can't help but make the comparison between that tower and the tobacco mills in the foreground. Today, that tower and the dozen other hospital buildings on that campus feel like permanent fixtures of the local economic landscape. The health system's 24,000 employees make it the largest employer in Richmond, just as tobacco once was. But the, self, but the same self-assured hubris that was the undoing of big tobacco in Richmond may well be coming for the hospitals of our world. Could the hospital's days, at least as we have presently understood it, be numbered? Or can they reinvent themselves fast enough to avoid going the way of the tobacco mills just down the hill? The modern hospital was conceived and refined 300 years ago during the Enlightenment era, a time when the goal was to cure, when we mainly died of traumatic injury, when we mainly died of cholera and other infectious diseases, when patients were the object of care, when technologies that could improve care were not readily wearable or in these devices that we carry around in our pockets, hospitals were then, and they remain costly and very challenging to operate. And most of those in current use uh, were built decades, of decades ago, like the building that you see here on the screen. Uh, maintaining and managing them has become cumbersome and difficult. And we are becoming healthier. I mean, the, the truth is the last year notwithstanding health technologies breakthroughs in surgical, surgical technique and vaccine uh, uh, therapies and novel diagnostics, even preventative health have made it possible for us as humans to live longer and healthier and make us less dependent on hospital care. To be sure the last year we've, knows, we've noticed that we need to radically accelerate hospital care in certain times of crisis, but the overall trajectory has been a decline in the need for inpatient beds. Virtual care has made it possible to receive much of what we need remotely in our homes. Many aspects of surgical care have moved out of the hospital to ambulatory day surgery centers. Mobile x-ray and laboratories can do now much of what we used to do in a hospital in our communities. And video conferencing has made subspecialty knowledge available in our community doctor's offices. Here in the US, the CEO of a large system of 23 hospitals told me recently that for the first time, in 2019, hospitals were the minority contributor to his bottom line. He runs a 23 hospital network, the largest network of hospitals in his state. And yet for the first time, hospitals contributed less to his bottom line than all of the other businesses he was operating. The R&D enterprise, the spin-off companies that they uh, launched from their R&D, the data services that they were selling and reselling, the ambulatory services that were part of their effort, the retail clinics that they provided advisory services to, and their investment portfolio. Those sources, those companies, those subsidiary revenue streams had now added together, had now for the first time outpaced their hospital revenue. This is already happening and it will accelerate. Technology will get better. We will do more outside of hospitals. Our insurers and payers will not want to pay the costly overhead of hospitals. And frankly, I don't know very many people who still really want to go to a hospital any longer after the last year. So the question is, when will we declare that the way that we have been doing it, the way that we've been treating our patients inside of hospitals needs a fundamental rethink? We actually know a lot more about how to build a different health system, one that doesn't just aim for more healthcare, but inst instead tries to produce better health. Let me now take the rest of my time with you this morning or afternoon uh, to uh, share with you five uh, quick ideas. I guess it's still morning where most of you are, but uh, I'll share with you five quick ideas about a health create what a health creating system of the future might look like. These are by no means a comprehensive list, and they're really a, they're a first draft. 
And I'm, I'm hopeful that you all will contribute to these. We can evolve them together uh, now and in the future. So, all right, here are the, here's the first idea. Design idea number one is to shift digital health from invention to implementation. Technologies, like so many that we've been working with here in our health systems, are no longer working their way into health and healthcare. They are absolutely in integral to both environments. And yet I believe we are often too blinded by the possibility of digital health technologies only to fall short of realizing their kind of true impact, their true value, their true benefit. Beyond shifting, uh, a strengthening investment in telehealth, which is of course what gets a lot of attention these days, there are important strategies uh, and virtual care that have just exploded in recent times. Digital transformation, I believe, can realize even deeper effects. These are data from one of the health systems that we partner with that just demonstrate the explosion of, of, of telehealth and virtual care We've seen, seen a massive expansion of this and we will see more of it. But this isn't the whole story. Consider for a moment how good artificial intelligence guided diagnosis and triage technologies have become. AI now gets diagnostic and treatment accuracy 90 to 90% right for common conditions when compared to nurses and doctors in urgent care environments. 90 to 92% right. These technologies won't replace the doctor or the nurse wholesale. But as we see here in this slide, uh, they really can radically affect the capacity of a clinician to see patients. What you see on the top here is the, the activities of a clinician during their time in an, in an encounter, gathering facts, making a diagnosis, creating a treatment, arriving at a treatment, and then building a care plan and documenting it. These are the activities. And if AI-guided technologies and automated assistance can take care of a lot of the parts like the uh, initial gathering of facts, uh, it, the initial differential diagnosis formation, the care plan documentation, the charting, if all of that can be done by an AI guided automated assistant, panel sizes for the average primary care doctor can go from an average of around 200 people, patients, to potentially a panel size of 5,000 patients. And what's more with miniaturization and task shifting to advanced practice providers, we can start to allow routine hospitalization, even something as complex as hospitalization, to take place at home with patients receiving exactly what they would get in the home for common conditions like pneumonia, cellulitis, urinary tract infections, uh, IV therapy, labs, x-rays, now can be delivered via fully mobile services and subspecialty clinical advice can be sought from a remote command center. I spoke to a, a hospital home company that recently conducted their 1 millionth visit um, here in the US. So again, if we wonder whether this is happening, is absolutely part of our lived reality today. Many of you work or are around clinical units and hospitals across Canada, and you know as well as I, that clinical practice today is entirely, entirely reliant both upon a clinician's skill and compassion and technologies, pluripotent abilities to supply information and knowledge in real time. But the promise of these incredibly exciting digital therapeutics and diagnostics and monitoring systems, I believe are held hostage ultimately, just as more conventional medicines have been for decades to the human systems required to implement them. Years ago, IHI was started in effect with a pretty simple premise. We could work on those human systems. Uh, we could work on those human systems to take the fruits of clinical science, medications, new diagnostic assays, vaccines indeed, and we could work on them. Uh, we could more reliably deliver them to patients that would create lasting health effects. I think it's time now for a complementary agenda. Quality and reliability sciences must now be applied to improve the delivery of proven digital therapies and diagnostics. Just as we re create a reliable workflow that delivered antibiotics, for example, to help prevent sepsis death, we must now create workflows that will leverage new data sources and technologies to connect patients to providers, anticipate errors before they happen. Digital health will fundamentally change healthcare, just as antibiotics once did. But neither digital health technologies nor antibiotics can achieve the impact that they need to achieve without supporting implementation methods that ensures that the medicines that we have, digital or biochemical, get to the patient. Technologies that have had, have had another important effect, uh, they've also created more activated and engaged patient populations. And these patient populations have a transformed sense of ownership of their own health and the agency available to improve it themselves. 
we shouldn't be surprised by our patients' desires to co-produce care. We should expect and welcome it. And while our technical expertise as clinicians is always going to be important, the most essential contributor to outcomes, I think, will always be the person whose health is at stake. One example of this is, comes to us from a network called Improve Care Now. It's an example of something known as a learning health network, which is a fascinating experiment initiated by Cincinnati Children's Hospital for and crucially with children, kids with inflammatory bowel disease. Improve Care Now and its learning network encompass more than 35,000 patients across 100 hospitals and treatment centers, some of which are located internationally, most of which are inside the US. Inside this clinical network, patients actively trade knowledge with each other about how to live with their chronic diseases. Clinicians learn about best practices to take better care of children, and their encounter data then flows into a registry that researchers use who are also in the network to conduct studies that solve the practical problems faced by the children and, the, and their clinicians. In 10 years of remission rates across uh, this network of IBD patients, across these 35,000 children, have gone from an average of 55% across the network to over 80% across these 35,000 kids. This is a, a powerful new way of thinking about how we treat people at scale. And the concept is now expanding to many adult conditions. Uh, IHI is doing some work right now on better care for pancreas cancer. We're extending the idea to breast cancer, to end-stage renal disease, to epilepsy, and many other clinical conditions. Learning health networks, like Improved Care Now, like this one, will be how we conduct clinical care in the future, driven by patients, co-produced with clinicians, and supported by the research community in an integrated fashion. The third idea for a different system is uh, about how our duty to care must extend beyond the patient and family to the healthcare workforce. Uh, rates of physical and psychological harm were already on the rise before COVID. Uh, in fact, there was a, a report written um, some years ago now that documented the rates of physical injury in healthcare. And it was surprising to me because it showed for the first time that the risks of injury in healthcare exceeded risks seen in what I think of as high risk environment, mining, construction, manufacturing, industries that I think of as being very high risk industries. In fact, healthcare is riskier on a, on a total event rate uh, level than any of those other industries uh, uh, in their own rights. COVID has only made the situation worse, as all of us are, are brutally aware at this point in time. Physical and psychological safety of the workforce is more challenging than ever. In early 2020, before COVID was fully upon us, I had a chance to visit a health system in, in Texas. I was speaking to their chair of medicine, and, and he had asked me about what IHI's priorities were at the time. This is, again, pre-pandemic. I described our focus on safety. Uh, and uh, specifically on the safety of the clinical workforce. And he immediately stopped me. Um, and he started welling up with tears in his eyes. And he told me that just a few months before, his wife of 30 years had been assaulted by a patient in an ambulatory clinic just a few miles from where we were, where we were sitting. Uh, the patient that committed the assault had come in for a, a fairly routine visit um, to the clinic and got agitated when he was asked to pay a copay uh, that he could not afford. It's a bit of the tragedy of the American system that is on display here. Not only are we, uh, do, we can, do we have harms and injuries, but we also have affordability challenges that are very, very uh, significant in our country. My host wife uh, was the lead nurse of the clinic. And um, when the patient got a little agitated about paying the copay, uh, she took him aside to try to explain the situation further and maybe work out something that would be uh, workable for him. And unfortunately, the patient proceeded to attack her um, and broke her arm in three places and rendered her unconscious from head trauma. And she had been on leave when I met my host for, in Texas ever since. For two years now, IHI has been working with a group of 30 health systems focused on identifying evidence-based interventions to enhance physical and psychological safety and implementing these actions to reduce harm and injury to their workforce. This group, uh, which is part of IHI's Leadership Alliance, tracks serious harm events with the workforce uh, and has been doing so pre-pandemic. And their data indicates that COVID has led to spiking rates of workforce harm and injury. 
To help mitigate this impact, IHI published guidance in the middle of the pandemic on what we call psychological PPE for healthcare workers to help support each other during these challenging times uh, of the pandemic. And earlier in the year, just uh, about a month ago now, uh, IHI launched alongside of 10 US hospital CEOs, a CEO coalition to improve physical and psychological safety in the workforce. These 10 CEOs committed not only to safeguarding psychological and emotional health and to ensuring physical safety, but also to promoting health justice. Uh, and these leaders are responsible for some of the biggest systems and most important systems in the US. And I see no reason why a version of something like this couldn't be replicated in your environment today, in Canada right now, that would build on current efforts to address what matters most to healthcare workers during this time and be a central part of how we end up recovering from this pandemic. And you all as students and as researchers and as faculty members and as leaders could help spearhead something like this. There is no doubt that a workforce that is safe, joyful, and not afraid is absolutely essential to providing care that is safer, better, and more compassionate. The literature is unequivocal on this point. Workforce safety is not an add-on or an afterthought, it is in fact a driver for everything that we hope to do in keeping healthcare safer and more effective. 20 years ago, the Institute of Medicine invited us to consider six new aims for better healthcare. Uh, we talk about safety, effectiveness, efficiency, patient-centeredness, timeliness, and indeed equity. Two decades later, we have a lot of room to improve on all of these areas but perhaps none more so than the last of these on health equity. As I mentioned at the start of the talk, there can be no quality health system, in my view, that excludes many from the benefits of that system. There is simply no health creating system of our future without equity. I've been studying the work recently of John A. Powell, a professor of law and ethnic studies at UC Berkeley. Powell first articulated the framework of what we now know as targeted universalism. This is a theory that suggests that the better and perhaps more efficient path to universally held societal objectives may in fact be through the use of targeted strategies that help advantage those who have been systematically disadvantaged in the past and in the present. I think there's something to his theory. Consider the successes of our colleagues at South Central Foundation in Alaska who began their COVID vaccination efforts by focusing on the most marginalized Native Alaskan and American Indian populations. Their strategy led at least to a period for, to the highest per capita vaccination rate in the United States. If we focus as South Central did on the most marginalized and under-resourced communities, we can actually get to universally held goals like herd immunity faster and more effectively than if we pursued alternative strategies. For the past three years, IHI has been working on a program called Pursuing Equity with 32 health systems that are seeking to make equity a strategic priority for healthcare and that are working now to make lasting improvements in inequities that they see across a range of clinical conditions from diabetes care to uh, cardiovascular care to cancer care. Early data indicate that quality improvement methods designed to reduce variation at their core when applied to inequities can guess what? reduce unjust, unwarranted, and undesired variation. And while there have been a handful of non-US health systems in pursuing equity, once again, I'd love to see a full-fledged Canadian version of this effort. The biggest inequities that you face are likely to be different than those that we do across your Southern border, but I'm certain that you have those inequities in your systems and that deliberate effort to name the ills of racism and make improvements will be as vital to how your system gets better as they have been to how our system is getting better. 20 years ago, some of you watching this conference will remember a movement to make patient safety visible in healthcare. We did that work by naming harms. We can do the same by naming the harms perpetrated by racism and historic injustice. We then measured those harms in rates of infections and injuries. We can now measure disparities and inequities. And then we work to eradicate those harms using improvement science, policy, and regulation. And now we must do the same for the inequities we see in healthcare. Make them visible, work to eliminate them, 
inequities are simply not inevitabilities and any health creating system of our future will seek their elimination. Okay, the last idea uh, before we come to a close. For decades, we've seen health systems, policymakers and academics create amazing models of care. And yet pilot projects made in one part of the system have had tremendous difficulty scaling and spreading throughout the system. This past year, however, we've watched scale up and spread like we've never seen it before and at a tempo that is absolutely breathtaking. We are witnessing it now in the biggest public health endeavor in a century, our global mass vaccination effort. There have been a few important lessons about meeting the moment that we think that I think we can learn from this time. We need focus, ambition, freedom, and infrastructure to get to scale. COVID supplied the razor sharp focus, one major problem, one clear and consistent mission. We need goals and ambitions that operate at the scale of the problem, not mere incrementalism, but transformation. Herd immunity demands ambition. It also requires freedom to innovate and create, which led directly to unleashing the ingenuity of our frontline healthcare workers and so many of you. And lastly, I believe we need infrastructure, a system that brings actors together that have the capacity to solve big problems together. COVID has made this possible, but we have to continue to replicate those lessons uh, on scale up in other environments. For the past five years, IHI has been working on something that we call the age-friendly health system, an initiative in part modeled on work we learned about in Canada on senior-friendly care. Age-friendly sought to change care for older adults across the US by bringing focus to four primary evidence-based practices known as the four M's, which you see here on the screen. They include what matters to older adults, an emphasis on medications or polypharmacy, uh, re, you know, re, uh, working on mentation and uh, depression, dementia, and delirium in different settings, and then emphasizing functional status or mobility. The initiative has been very successful even during the pandemic and has now built a network of over 2,000 clinical practices across the country that have become age-friendly. The results are stunning. Fewer readmissions, less delirium, fewer emergency room visits, shorter lengths of stay, meaning much more time at home with loved ones which is the true measure of success. Once again, an effort like this deserves global spread. And I hope that it could be replicated potentially with older adults in Canada. And we must extend these lessons uh, to provide age-friendly care to other ambulatory clinics, nursing homes, and long-term care settings. In nursing homes, for example, together with co colleagues at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, IHI and its partners currently operate the largest nursing home quality network in the world a group of now 9,000 nursing homes, all actively working to improve their response to COVID-19. Scale like this is possible, uh, but it requires a uh, health creating activities in the future. So there you have it. There's my uh, five design ideas for a health creating system uh, that we very much need. I'm sure these aren't exactly right, and uh, I hope you can help me make them better. And I'll leave you with one last thought uh, prior uh, prior to taking your questions. Just before taking on the role of uh, leading IHI, uh, I led IHI's innovation team, as, as Taylor described at the beginning. And for years, that team used a principle to help us create new models of care and new ways of doing things in healthcare. The principle, which you see here on the screen, is to remove prevailing system faults. Because when you tether to incumbency, your mind can wander uh, well, actually, when you lose the tether uh, to incumbency, when you lose that grounding in what we've always done before, we can start to imagine what is really needed to solve the challenges we face today. The design of the IHI triple aim uh, emerged from this principle, the simple idea that the aims of better care, uh, better health, and lower cost do not need to compete with each other, which was the previously accepted dogma, but can in fact reinforce each other, came from this idea of removing prevailing system faults. And perhaps the most incredible characteristic of the past year, other than anything else I've said uh, to you today, perhaps the most incredible characteristic has been the fact that during this pandemic, we have reconsidered accepted system truths. We have reconsidered truths about who we are and what we can do. We used to believe that coordination across a whole city's health system was impossible. Now it is our reality in New York and London and so many other places in the world. We used to believe that we couldn't develop a vaccine in under a year. Now we know we can. We may have once thought that we couldn't face down a global emergency in a massive coordinated effort, 
but we are in fact living that reality today. And what's more, the spirit, mission, and purpose of improvement and of improvers like so many of you is absolutely at the heart of every part of the story that is still being written by every one of you. Thanks for having me here today, and I look forward to hearing your questions, uh, and so I'll stop here now. Thank you so much, Dr. Ate. Um, that was excellently said, and I think a lot of us really appreciate all those points and your stories to illustrate them. Um, I do have a couple questions here, and we do have a little bit of time. Um, Mahan from UBC has said, are there any specific examples or general concerns with AI and the potential for it to decrease or compromise quality of care? I, I don't think we know the answer to that question yet, uh, Mahan, so thank you for it. Uh, I think there's a lot of work that's going to be going into in, in upcoming uh, years. There's going to be a lot of work that goes into the impact of technology in general, uh, uh, virtual care, for example, AI, um, a, a number of other digital health therapeutics, et cetera, uh, and the impact of that on quality, on safety, on ultimately on cost will all be, I think, uh, open for discussion and will be contemplated, I think, in the near future. The, 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 I think the opportunity that AI creates for us right now um, is, you know, as I said in my, in my comments, this incredible potential uh, ability for clinicians to focus their time on the parts that they can uniquely add value to um, and, you know, eliminate some of the tasks that they need to conduct that are non-value added necessarily that can be handled through, uh, through other mechanisms. But a lot of this will be, will be uh, demonstrated over time. Um, and I, I don't think we have a clear answer to that yet. Uh, I will say importantly that we don't really have good quality and safety measurement for much of our um, uh, virtual care at this time, which is a problem that I think a lot of organizations are, are sensitive to and aware of. So uh, more to come on this question around defining what the measures ought to be measuring quality and safety as a result of technical uh, changes, technology-related changes, and then being able to say whether or not, uh, being able to take on um, intervention, if you will, to try to improve quality and safety in those environments. Thank you. Yeah, it definitely sounds like it's gonna be a whole new era of medicine coming up as these technologies get developed. Um, another question from Alessandro at UBC. And this one is with regards to the at-home hospitals that you were referring to. He says, do you think um, options like hospital at-home risk, oh, sorry, do you think options like hospital at-home risk amplifying existing disparities? Um, I mean, the, answer, the, the short answer to your question, Alessandra, is yes. Uh, do I think uh, options uh, risk amplifying disparities? Absolutely without deliberate design to try to build into the design a desire to reduce those disparities, I can almost promise you that they will exacerbate inequities and disparities, right? So if we don't, if we don't build it that way, it will get, the, the natural inclination of power is to hold on to power. The natural inclination of technology companies is to provide their services to those that can afford them, which tend to be the, the more resourced individuals in a society. So the natural inclination for all such technical developments, whether AI, or hospital at home, or even a new drug or diagnostic, uh, is that it, the benefits will accrue to those that have, and they will not accrue without intentional design to those that do not have. Uh, just a macro example of this is the vaccine story globally at the moment. Who is getting access to the vaccines right now? Right? It's not, a, it's not an accident of history. It is, what is, it is what will happen without deliberate design and attention to uh, ensuring equity in the distribution of vaccine. The same will be true of hospital at home. The benefits will accrue without, I'm 100% certain of this, the benefits will accrue to those that have and the advantage in the population, unless we build it into the design of hospital at home, that the approach to hospital at home, that the approach to AI, that the approach to uh, Livongo or Verta Health or you name it, whatever the technology is that's gonna help with the care of a particular condition or a population, that the approach that's built into this is in fact it one that not only seeks to reduce or improve median performance of the system, but one that actually also seeks to close disparity gaps that might be present in the system. If we build it that way, by the way, if we do build it that way, all the evidence that we've accumulated over now two and a half years, three years of doing pursuing equity suggests 
that you can actually build better systems that both improve median performance and close disparity gaps simultaneously. So to me, it's a question of aim setting and a question of whether we bake it into design. Um, you know, uh, but I can promise you it will exacerbate inequity unless we unless we do that. Thank you. Um, a question from Kristen Short says, how can we promote engagement and meaningful compliance in the implementation process of quality improvement strategies? So I guess it's really that first step there. So promoting engagement and meaningful compliance and implementation process of QI. Uh, I suppose, uh, you know, thank you, Kristen, for the question. Uh, I suppose the, the, the I, 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 I hope I'm not overemphasizing the question of design in, in the discussion here, but you know, to me, engagement um, implies that uh, something is being designed for someone that you're trying to engage someone in, um, right? So if I design a new treatment protocol for my patients with diabetes, having not built it with them, then I would need to engage them in the thing that I've created for them. Uh, so implicit in the notion of engagement uh, is this idea that you build it somehow separate from the population that is intended, the intended beneficiary, the intended user, the intended community that would benefit from the whatever it is. When we talk about um, quality improvement activities, the same principle holds, right? We have to, instead of designing quality improvement activities and strategies, uh, for a population, for a community, for a ICU, for a, uh, a community clinic, for a, um, um, a clinical community of practitioners, a group of heart failure docs or nurses or whatever, instead of doing it for, design it differently, design it with, so that you're not after the fact trying to figure out how to bridge some engagement separation um, that you're trying to retrofit and, and figure out afterwards. I was just, uh, Taylor knows this because we were talking about before, I was just on a call uh, presenting to a group of deep prescribing researchers. This is an international network of individuals that uh, are trying to reduce medication burden and cost and uh, the impact on quality. And they were talking about how to connect their research to implementation and uh, the need for this field of dissemination science, which is disseminating research findings so that they get picked up by practitioners to me implies once again, a design failure. You know, you're, you're essentially creating a, a, a new field of dissemination research to bridge an original problem, which is that the researchers and the practitioners should have been in dialogue to begin with. And the same thing I think is, is the problem uh, around engagement strategies for improvers. If we don't build with the target audience, the, the intended community, the intended beneficiaries and ask them what matters to them from the beginning, uh, then, we, then we'll suffer this engagement problem. Uh, but we can do it differently if we if we design again from the start differently. Awesome, thank you. Um, this one's a little bit longer, but it's from Caroline. Sorry, the name's connected here. Caroline Wang. Um, she points out first that Canada has a very different health system with universal coverage for hospitals and physician care, with some different challenges and strengths compared with the U.S. Her question is, what are the unintended consequences of transporting system models from the US and lack of diversity of models dash alternative options, especially in the context of the COVID pandemic response? What should be done, I guess this is part two, for evaluation and to avoid mistakes in scaling up wrong models and whole system design? Yeah, for one thing, I think there's no, um... There is, to my knowledge, HI now works in 30 some odd countries, there is no perfect system. And certainly the US system is probably the least perfect or whatever, the, the least uh, um, um, enviable or emulable system that we have. The one thing about the US system, which is interesting is it has a lot of experiments within it. So what's, what's interesting about the US system is it's not a monolith. You know, it has a lot of uh, very interesting experimentation uh, that's occurring in each of the states. Each state has a, essentially a slightly different system. Our Medicare system and our Medicaid system are, are very different. There's tons of innovation taking place throughout the system um, in the US. Uh, so some of the advantages of having a, uh, uh, in some ways, a less universal system. I, I actually am a believer in um, uh, some of what Canada does in terms of its uh, payment strategy and its provi pro provider strategy. 
However, there are some advantages, I think, to the, um, um, the more heterogeneous environment in the US in that you get to observe the potential value of a lot of different innovations occurring in different parts of the system. That said, I think there's no perfect system. There, there simply isn't. And uh, I, you know, the, the question that you're asking about unintended consequences of transporting a particular approach to a new place without customization, without um, uh, local adaptation, uh, without a, um, a sense of variation in how it's implemented, I think would be true in any system, uh, whether it's Canada, a Canadian idea being ported to the US or a US idea being ported to Canada or an idea from Brazil or whatever. The, you know, the, 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 the notion, I think, uh, you know, we use this uh, conceptual idea of what we call tight, loose, tight, when we're trying to adapt any, any piece of evidence or any, any model that we might discover or find. We're typically tight on aims and tight on measures. So the goals of the initiative and how we might understand progress against that initiative, we are we hold firm to. So on age friendly, it's you know for example, it's uh, um, you know we want to see a, a lower morbidity and mortality. That's the goal. Uh, we have a set of measures associated with that uh, goal, including outcome measures as well as experience measures and cost measures. Uh, but exactly how you implement those four M's that I described of age friendly is highly variable by care setting. And that's the loose part. And, and I think that's really vital to uh, implementing changes in any, any environment, you know, tight on aims, tight on measures, and loose on how you implement the model. And giving people freedom and flexibility to, to implement and adapt is vital actually to creating stickiness, to creating buy-in and will, um, as well as to creating the, the very relevant local adaptations of any particular design uh, to that environment. Thank you so much. Um, we are a little bit almost done on time. Um, I'm gonna pull up one more question here. I actually skipped Rodrigo's earlier. Um, and you spoke on this a little bit, so I'm not sure if you can continue a little bit, but his question was, what solutions are currently being developed to guard against the threats to cybersecurity and confidentiality in an increasing virtual healthcare environment? Um, I'm not sure if you're able to speak to that at this point. It's a good question, Rodrigo. I mean, I think, this is a, a, a really important question. Uh, just you know, last week, one of our partners, Greater Baltimore Medical Center in, in, in Baltimore, uh, was subject to a ransomware attack that took down their whole system. It, this is happening with increasing frequency, um, increasing uh, degree of penetration, you know, the degree to which these, uh, 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 whatever you want to call it, the hackers are, you know, are able to access our networks. Uh, is getting more and more sophisticated. I don't have a good solution for this uh, at the moment. It's not specifically um, my realm of expertise, to be sure. But it's, you're, you're absolutely right that the, the, the realm of, uh, you know, the, 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 as we become more virtual, as so much more of our information lives in, in uh, the cloud and in virtual environments, that this is going to become an increasingly uh, important question. Uh, to protect our systems against uh, some of what we're experiencing. So I completely appreciate your, your question. Can I make one other comment, Taylor? I know we're almost out of time here, but I want to answer or respond to, to I, I don't know uh, the name here, but it's a chat from 1.25 p.m., at least my time, A. Newman at MD Anderson, who asks about healthcare systems building equity and inclusion dashboards on key metrics. Um, in two weeks' time, IHI will release its version of its equity and inclusion dashboard um, not, I'm not arguing that it's uh, comprehensive or uh, exactly what every system ought to do necessarily, uh, but it is a start. And I think you know, reporting on diversity, inclusion, and equity measures is absolutely important for us in a in a in a public way, in a transparent form. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna encourage health systems around the globe that we have that opportunity to partner with to to do exactly the same in their in their environments. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that and. Give us your feedback on it. It's a, it's our first go at it, but um, we'll be uh, iterating it as well and would welcome feedback. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Mate. This has been incredible and we're so honored to have you here speaking to us at our IHI conference. Um, so thank you very much. And we look forward, we have recorded this session for anyone who had to leave early or needed to go. Um, but we really appreciate your time and participation. Pleasure to be with you. Uh, good luck with the rest of the meeting. It looks really exciting. And uh, 
send, send me your ideas. I, I look forward to hearing from so many of you uh, about your thinking. Uh, change those principles. Uh, they're definitely not right. Uh, look forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for everyone else, I have linked the chats and the codes for the next session if you need it. Um, if not, it's also in your conference package and those will be starting shortly. Um, so we'll see you then. Thank you.